Uh, I have on the line Richard Noble, OBE, um, who you may know the name, but you may not know why the name. But one of the reasons is because he held the world land speed record. Um, when, when was that, Richard? Uh, it's a long time ago, Lee. <laughs> 1983, 633 miles an hour. Now, I've got to ask you, before we go into talking about the current project, which is Bloodhand, what does it feel like to travel at 633 miles an hour on the ground? Well, the interesting thing about it, Lee, is, is really this, is that you've got to get rid of all the emotion. The emotion is dangerous. Uh, so it's got to be a cold clinical um, uh, activity, really, driving the car. And um, you're part of a team, and you're out every day driving the car just a little bit faster every day until eventually, you know, you cop the, uh, the world record. So that was what it's about. It is the most extraordinary experience because you're know, sitting in a car there with 35,000 horsepower. That was in the case of uh, my car, Thrust 2. Um, and um, the, uh, the engine is from a Lightning fighter. And it's not quite powerful enough, so we have to abuse the engine, something terrible to get there. Um, between uh, the car is running on aluminium wheels without tires, so um, we don't have much grip on the desert. And the desert is a special sort of desert called an alkali plier which is not salt. Salt is too hard. And so it's a, um, it's a kind of soft, dried mud desert. And that does the job of the tires. So that's how the thing, thing works. So between zero and about 300 miles an hour, it's all over the shop. Um, but, um, uh, and what you've got to do is you're driving down a lane, which is just 50 foot wide. So you've got to maintain that lane. If you lose that lane, you're going to mess up the whole track. So uh, you've got to stay in the lane. Um, and as you accelerate, um, you realize that the car is very unstable directionally. And you've got to fight it a bit like a rally car. But the important thing is that you must not uh, take your foot off the accelerator. Because if you take your foot off the accelerator, that wrecks the, uh, the top speed. So you've got to keep your foot flat to the floor. When you get to 300 miles an hour, then um, we've got a decent airflow over the tail fins. And the car starts to go a lot straighter. So then uh, it becomes a, little, a lot easier. And uh, between 300 and 550 miles an hour, it's boring. It's just more of the same, just a lot faster. And then once you get towards 600, it starts to get really exciting. You see the shock waves build up over the uh, over the, the front wheels, the front, oh, front wow. uh, bodywork. Uh, so and then you're into the measured mile at 650 miles an hour. And the fascinating thing about it is that the human body is just absolutely amazing. Uh, you can see every single detail on the track as the car travels at 650 miles an hour. It's, just, That's it's amazing. an extraordinary experience. But, I mean, you know, I've been doing it for a long time, so consequently, you, 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 you know, you're pretty experienced. I can drive to a lateral accuracy of one and a half inches Good at 650 grief. miles an hour. You go through the measured mile, and then you've got to think about stopping. <laughs> That's on the fun <laughs> start. So uh, it, you're traveling very, very fast. And so what you've got to do is you've got to count to three um, to cool the engine and then cancel the engine. Um, and then, uh, and only then can you find the brake parachute. So if you can imagine that huge engine is slowly turning down, winding down, and, uh, it's still very, very draggy at the front end where the intake is. So, and you fire that brake parachute and you immediately get between five and six G deceleration. So you're losing speed at 130 odd miles an hour a second. Um, so that's pretty violent. And you get uh, an extraordinary thing called the somatographic illusion. And what happens is that uh, your balance is given to you by your uh, inner ears. And your balance is given to you by your inner ears. And, uh, um, uh, and, what, and they're disturbed by the severe deceleration. And, um, the, um, and so you've got an extraordinary effect, um, which is that the horizon um, tends, to, um, ten, ten, tends to kind of go up. And you are convinced that you are driving straight into the center of the world. <laughs> down a mine shaft. It's the most extraordinary experience. Wow! But you're safe because the parachute is out on its uh, on its um, strop at the back, and it's holding the car straight. And then you're um, into your then you're down to sort of literally 400 miles an hour. And uh, <laughs> you know, at that point, you want to get out and walk alongside. <laughs> it's very boring. <laughs> so I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I I have actually driven um, a dragster, and I oh good. I've been up how to you, how, how did you do? Yeah. Pretty appalling. I got <laughs> they reckon I hit about 150 and then backed off and frightened myself and got crossed the line doing 100. But the 
exhilaration. Well, yeah, but I mean, that's a start, Lee. Yeah. <laughs> the exhilaration was awesome. And I, I was just trying to compare the two. But no, I mean, yeah, OK, you, you go up to 300 and then you go beyond that. And that's that must be just yep. awesome. <laughs> well, it's a long, long time ago, uh, but uh, it's not something you forget very easily. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> now, thrust two. Um, as you said, yep. did over a thousand kilometres per hour, six hundred and thirty-three. Correct. Yes. Miles an hour. But and what was great about it, Lee, was that it achieved its design speed. So that is a huge compliment to John Ackroyd, the designer. Oh, that was what I was going to say. That the team around you, um, the team who who construct and build and you know sort of theorise these cars, must be absolutely incredible. Yeah, because you see, what had happened in that particular case is that the last British record was uh, Donald Campbell's at 403. The Americans had then put on another 600 and, uh, and 20 odd miles on, now on top of that. Uh, so consequently, the, the knowledge base in Britain was very, very poor. So we really had to invent a lot of stuff in order to get there. Now you see that this is this is something which I love that the it is a sort of glorified man in a shed thing, isn't it? Because you you're developing. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be Lee, it used to be, but now it's very high technology, and uh, of course you know we're dealing with supersonic vehicles. We're producing vehicles now which go faster than airplanes and jet fighters. Well, yeah, I mean the the new car, um, Bloodhound, yeah, um, Bloodhound SSC, which Andy Green is going to be driving. I mean, that, yep. you you are sort of pushing it further and further and further. And I know the aim is a 1,000 miles an hour, which is beyond comprehension, really, isn't it? Well, we'll do that, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we set out to do that, and the car has been designed to do that, and it's been built to do that, and uh, uh, we've got to get starting running it uh, um, urgently, which is what we do uh, this year. We're on to... We're down to South Africa this year to get it up to 500 miles an hour plus. That it, you know, the, the thing is people sort of, I guess, can't really understand why you can't just run it at 1,000 miles an hour now. You know, just Andy gets in, turns the key and off he goes. But there is so much development involved and in, in sort of safety checking the vehicle as well. Yes, absolutely. Let's talk about that. The, the thing about it is, of course, we are innovating and pioneering. And there's not much uh, there's not much of a database to fall back on. So consequently, you know, you're creating everything. And of course, the car itself uh, is a very special shape. It's taken five years of computational fluid dynamics to um, uh, evaluate and prove the shape. Um, but of course, that's computer work, and we have to we have to prove it for real. The other thing too about it is that uh, we make lots and lots of runs, gradually increasing the um, the speed, and then basically. Uh, the car collects 30 gigabytes of data every single run. So we can start to compare that with the, uh, with the database, uh, the research database, and make sure you know, we're uh, reasonably aligned. Um, and then also it puts a huge pressure on the team because uh, the, uh, the engineers are, res are actually responsible for defining the run profiles. So they've all got to agree the run profiles before Andy goes out and drives the car. So yeah. that puts a lot of pressure on everybody. And... Uh, if we can't get agreement, then um, and it's all over. We have to go home. Oh goodness! We're, we're dangerous. But I mean, Andy, um, love him, is is almost like the the end bit, isn't he? Although he must have an input as well. Yes, yeah, it's very interesting the relationship. Um, Andy is uh, is not a member of the design team. The design team is run by Mark Chapman, who's our chief engineer, and Andy is the driver. But Andy's. Andy and I started this thing, so we're, I guess we're responsible <laughs> for it. And um, so consequently, uh, Andy's in on all the technical meetings and he's involved uh, in it in a big, big way. Because, of course, he's got to understand every technical decision made around the car. It's the job of a test pilot, effectively. You've really got to know everything that there is to be known about the vehicle. Yeah, you, you have to know it inside out, intimately. Let's put it that way. Yes. Um, yep. And Andy and is... To, of course, be involved... Go on, sorry, yes. And he is a, an, an ex... Well, he still is a pilot. I mean, you can't be an ex-pilot, can yes, you? Yes, he is. He's, uh, um, uh, he's not a military pilot anymore, but he's, he's got his beloved extra um, uh, aerobatic airplane, so he's out there <laughs> most weekends upside down, yeah. Now, to do something like this, to take on a project like this, it's not something you can look at cheaply. 
the funding for it must be absolutely astronomical. Well, no, this is the interesting thing about it, Lee, which is that it doesn't have to be on Formula One, one levels. Oh. I mean, we develop as much publicity as a Formula One team, as a top Formula One team. I mean, it's absolutely enormous. We're in 220 countries at the moment. Uh, every country in the world, that is, except for North Korea and Vatican City. <laughs> so uh, if anybody knows the Pope out there, that would be helpful. I'll have a word. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, and um, basically it's very interesting that if you run a project um, with effectively a very flat organization, so you've got people very, very highly motivated, and not only do they have their responsibilities, but they've also got the appropriate authorities to go with it, then you do get the most extraordinary levels of productivity. And uh, that keeps them the, the money within sensible levels. It's going to, We're going to see it through about... 65 to 70 million, which is a very, very small beer compared with the Formula One team at 400 million. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. But the other thing you said there, your team is very dedicated. They're very proactive. They, they want this thing to succeed, don't they? Oh, Lord, yes, yes. I mean, it's, uh, we, we laugh about it a bit, but it's what it is. is our, um, it's a tombstone project. <laughs> It's something you put on your tombstone. <laughs> hey, look at me. This is what I did. You know? yeah. <laughs> I was involved in Bloodhound. Now, the, yeah. The name Bloodhound, where, where, did, where did that come from? <laughs> well, we had some interesting problems, um, which was basically when, we, when Andy and I started uh, the Bloodhound program, there was the question of the name. And I was against using the thrust name because we had broken the sound barrier in 1997. And now we're going to get 30% faster. And if, for instance, the new project were to fail, it would wreck the thrust name for the, uh, for the team that had broken the sound barrier. So I felt that very strongly what we'd better do is to uh, find another name. And uh, it was one of those blooming obvious things because uh, the most important person in the entire project is Ron Ayers, who's the aerodynamicist. And uh, his great claim to fame was the Bloodhound Missile. And this was Britain's uh, surface-to-air prime defense missile for about 20 years. It was an astonishing achievement. This thing would go from zero to twice the speed of sound in about two or three seconds. I mean, it's absolutely astonishing. And uh, Ron was the aerodynamicist behind it. So um, it's really homage to Ron. Now, having mentioned that, the, the engines, once in, in, in Bloodhound, because there are two engines, aren't there? They're quite special. Three engines. Three! Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. So, well, let's explain it. Um, basically, Ron uh, specified the car, and uh, he said that what we wanted was um, a jet engine and a rocket engine. Um, the jet engine, um, you know, the, this car has to have the performance and power-to-weight ratio, so we need the most uh, advanced military jet engine we can, which is what we've got, which is the EJ200 Eurofighter engine. So that produces 40% of the power, and 60% of the power comes from a NAMO hybrid rocket. And uh, the hybrid rocket, basically, uh, what happens there is that we pump high-test peroxide, a ton of it, into the rocket motor in, uh, what is it, 17 seconds Gosh. at 1,000 PSI. And uh, the high-test peroxide um, uh, basically degrades immediately, instantaneously, into superheated steam and oxygen. And that oxygen enables the rocket motor to run and to burn. But we've got to pump it in, so we've got a large Jaguar five, 550 horsepower engine <laughs> in the middle, which simply just drives the fuel pump. So you've actually got a proper, normally aspirated car engine in there. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and a fully developed one, and not a race one. So um, you know, because it's built right into the middle of the car. <laughs> now, one of the things you know, you you were talking about slowing down just just at the beginning. Yeah. When the car comes to the slowing down point. It's obviously yep. a totally different weight to when it started because you've burnt all that That's fuel. That's right. We've got rid of a, a ton of high-test peroxide. And uh, we've also got rid of, um, and I can't remember exactly how many litres of jet fuel, but that's, that's not a big concern. It's a high-test peroxide, which is very heavy, and it's in the middle. And that's positioned about the centre of gravity of the car, so it doesn't actually affect the, uh, the balance of the car. Ah, right. Okay. <laughs> I was just suddenly thinking, you know, that they talk about Formula One cars, you know, getting lighter as they go round. Well, this thing's yeah. going to be substantially lighter when it gets to the end of its run. Well, it's only a ton out of seven and a half. So, of course, yes. Know, yeah, it's quite a, it's a heavy beast. So when does South Africa come in, come on then? 
Okay, well, South Africa is absolutely crucial to the whole thing. Um, the what's got to happen, Lee, is that the car has got to be designed um, to the desert, and the desert's got to be designed to match the car. Mm. Uh, okay, because if you get a mismatch there, then you know you're going to have all sorts of difficulties. Um, so we wanted to run uh, the Black Rock Desert in Nevada, which is where we ran Thrust Two and Thrust SSC. But uh, unfortunately, the uh, the Americans have a um, a lot of leisure activities there, which have wrecked the desert, so that's no good. So we searched around for an alternative, and we found this wonderful place called Hakskeen Pan in South Africa. It's just up on the border between South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia. It's just at that sort of intersection. Mm-hmm. And um, it's absolutely ideal. It's the right altitude, which is what we want. It's got an eight-month weather window, so that's brilliant. And um, it's got the right surface, but there were two problems. There was a road on a causeway going across the middle. And also there was 21 million square meters of surface stones. Otherwise, it was absolutely ideal. <laughs> not, a <laughs> not a lot of problems. And the Northern Cape, uh, uh, Northern Cape government, the provincial government, decided they would support us. And so what they've done is that they've employed uh, 300 people for I can't, years to actually pick up all the stones. No, and this is—it's a wonderful thing because it's changed the um, the entire economy out in this little desert town called Reefontein. It's it's uh, the Mayor District, and uh, kind of when they started, um, you know, people were very very poor. There was ninety percent unemployment, and uh, uh, no mobile phone signals, and no water. They were living off boreholes. The whole thing was just uh, you know really desperately basic. And as a result of the Bloodhound coming, then basically they've been given a water pipeline, which is terrific. They've um, got Bloodhound education. Um, uh, we've got the big MTN masts have gone up, so that takes the data from the car and bounces across the uh, Kalahari Desert, so that goes into the internet there. And those masts are also used to provide um, uh, mobile communication. So they've suddenly got mobile communication. It's changed the whole place. It's absolutely brilliant. It sounds fantastic. And they've done about a thousand man years of work to do it. Wow. Wow. But what a brilliant thing to do. So you, you're off over there, I guess, fairly soon. Yes. Yeah. The idea is to get down there um, September, October. That's what we're working to at the moment. Mm-hmm. And what we're going to do then is we're going to run the car on its jet engine alone. And we're just going to learn. And we're going to run it to 500 odd miles an hour probably a bit faster than that we're just going to learn um and also get get uh and deal with basically the low speed handling and the medium speed handling get that out of the way and then we come back in 2019 with a jet and uh, one rocket mm-hmm. and that should get us a new world land speed record of about 800 and then we stop uh, and this is crucial because at that point um we've got a supersonic airflow mature supersonic airflow over the car and we can take the data from that and then compare it directly with the uh, uh, the research data. And then we can make a decision whether we're, we're, uh, we're going to go on to the 1,000 or whether it's gone as fast as it's going to go. So, uh, um, you know, stability is incredibly important in all this for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah. But um, we're, we're, we're very positive and we think we've got a really good aerodynamic solution. And to my way of thinking, there's no reason why we can't push on to the 1,000. But uh, we'll have to get that data and just confirm that. Okay, well, we will keep our fingers crossed. Hopefully, we'll make contact with you again um, once you've been over to South Africa and uh, run the car yeah. on the jet. Well, and let me just make make a point because your uh, your your listeners may be really interested in this, might want to follow it. So, if they go into the Bloodhound website, um, yeah. bloodhoundssc.com, dot com, um, they can put their names on the tail of the car. So, we've got thirty five thousand names on the tail now. Oh, wow. uh, which is terrific. We take over 100,000 names on the tail, so that's pretty good. There's a bit of space left there, so that's good. Uh, they can obviously join the supporters club, and, of course, they can come out to um, South Africa and come and see it all run, be a part of it. Right, that's it. I'm going to get on bloodhoundssc.com and get my name on the tail. <laughs> good man, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Richard. It's been an absolute pleasure my talking pleasure. to you. Thank you so much. And I know an awful lot more now about Bloodhound, and so hopefully to an awful lot more people. Thank you once again for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Bye now. Bye.